Our next speaker is uh, Russell Smith, and, and I, I do have to say as an aside, I, I have a, a great board that I get to work with, have the privilege of working with a lot of people with a lot of varied talents, but when you need an advertisement or a banner ad or a flyer with a picture of an airplane on it, it's really nice to be able to go to a world-class artist and say, hey dude, just take care of this for me and know that what you're going to get back. Now we can just teach him zip codes. <laughs> Russell Smith is an artist fellow in the American Society of Aviation Artists and has been painting World War I aviation subjects exclusively for the past 11 years. Russell's work can be found in collections around the world including three paintings on display in the Omaka Aviation Heritage Center in New Zealand. He's been recognized by several publications including Over the Front, Over the Front, oh, Over the Front, <laughs> American Art Collector, uh, American uh, Aviation History Flight Journal and this, 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 this British magazine I've heard of before and the Italian publication JP4. Uh, Russell has also been the recipient of several awards and honors and is a three-time recipient of the James V. Roy Award Best of Show in the American Society of Aviation Artists Annual Jury Exhibition <coughs> and most recently, last weekend, took home the Best of Show in the CAE Semi-Flight Aviation Art Exhibition in Dallas, Texas for his work, Eagle and the Butterfly. Here to talk to us about the evolution of an image is our good friend, Mr. Russell Smith. All right, well, thank you. And I want to thank JR and the board and all you guys for letting me get up here and run my mouth for 45 minutes. Uh, this presentation is probably going to be a little bit different from the one, other ones we've been hearing in that I'm not going to present you with a bunch of uh, new information. But it's appropriate that I'm probably uh, coming, following at the end of this, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how I take the information and the research that a lot of you guys do, and I put it together to create a visual historical narrative. Now, the idea of history as a subject for art is not a new thing. Uh, this has been going on for centuries and centuries. The Romans gave us a depiction of Alexander battling the Persians in a mosaic found in Pompeii. Michelangelo gave us the drawings for a, a depiction of the Battle of Cascina. The French neoclassicist David gave us his interpretation of the death of Socrates. We all know this one. Uh, Emmanuel Gottlieb Loitz uh, gave us his depiction of Washington crossing the Delaware 75 years after this would have happened. Okay. And one of my favorites, this one's called Police Verso by a French academic. Uh, named Jean-Léon Jérôme. Uh, this depicts a scene that could have easily happened 1900 years before this was actually painted. And a little piece of trivia that Greg Van Weingarten told me a couple of days ago, this is actually the painting that gave birth to the myth of the thumbs up and thumbs down. Oh, oh, interesting. Now, the late 19th century uh, saw a departure from subject-driven art. <coughs> subject -driven art to a more non-objective art which was based on taking uh, uh, principles and techniques of representationalism and making them the end product rather than a means to an end. We tend to use the term abstract art or modern art when we speak of these movements. Now fortunately for guys like me, more recently, the late 20th century has seen a revival of the techniques and the values which were taught by the French academics of the late 19th century um, and it's seen uh, a movement back towards representationalism. More contemporary artists are uh, going back to the representational style and abandoning the abstract style, uh, thus depicting nature in a way that uh, she more naturally reveals herself to us. Now, I'm a perpetual student of painting. I love to study art. I love to study great paintings. And the list of artists who have inspired me over the years is long, and uh, yeah, it would take me a long time to tell you all the guys who have inspired me. But generally speaking, I find the best expression of my own work in the uh, techniques and styles of the French academics of the mid and late uh, 19th century. Now, as I continue through my artistic journey, I find an increasing need to augment the analytical creativity of these French academics uh, with an intuitive creativity that can infuse a painting uh, with a sense of time and place. Now, aviation art, and especially those works that serve as historical narratives, tend to be based in factual accuracy. 
and technical accuracy. Uh, aviation, by nature, is a technically uh, is a technically accurate subject. History, of course, is based in factual accuracy. Now, there are two other kinds of accuracy that are oftentimes overlooked by aviation artists in this field. The first one is visual accuracy. And that is, what would your eyes and your brain actually perceive in a given situation? The second is emotional accuracy. And that is, what would it have been like to actually be in that place at that moment? And what I have to do when I'm creating a scene is I have to balance that technical accuracy, the historical accuracy, the emotional accuracy and the visual accuracy in a way uh, that balances that information so that I can actually portray a scene and get it a scene that feels right to the viewer. Now, just briefly, why do I paint war subjects? Why do I choose to do that? War in and of itself, as we all know from studying World War I, is a brutal and terrible subject. Uh, it seems like such a contrasting idea to the beauty of art, right? But um, the thing is, I enjoy telling stories. And I like to tell stories with my art. And I find that by bringing out the best and the worst aspects of humanity, war has the unique ability of showing us uh, stories of humanity at its most extreme. And I also have a, a theory about contrasts. Now in art, we use contrast to help guide the viewer's eye around the image. Uh, we use contrast of light and dark. We use contrast of hard edge and soft edge. Uh, we use contrasts of colors to make uh, colors seem more saturated. Often what you'll do is you'll place complements next to each other. If you want a blue to seem more blue, you place it next to an orange. It's sort of a yin and yang thing, if you will. Um, in that same way, war, which brings us uh, stories of such intense inhumanity, uh, can also provide us with stories of deep courage and sacrifice. And I think that placed against this backdrop of such brutal inhumanity, these stories of deep courage and sac sacrifice seem all the more profound. Now this presentation really isn't meant to be an instructional walkthrough. I don't expect you guys to be able to walk out of here and do what I do. I hope not, because then I'll be out of time. <laughs> but uh, I do find a surprising number of people uh, seem to be interested in how I go about doing this. So basically this is a walkthrough of my current process. And I say current because 10 years from now, I may do things completely differently. But I hope that when you leave here, you'll have a better appreciation of how this is done. And that being said, I want to refer to my friend Degas who said, painting is easy when you don't know how, but very difficult when you do. <laughs> now, excuse me for a second. In order to frame uh, this whole walkthrough, I'm going to choose one story. And let's go with this guy. Um, I think we all know who this is, some German pilot. But... Um, I'm not going to go over the facts of this story too deeply because the fact is most of you in this room probably know this story better than I do. Uh, but to skim over this, uh, on the morning of July 6, 1917, a flight of six FE-2Ds of 20 Squadron RFC departed San Marie Capel for an offensive patrol along the French-Belgian border. Led by Captain Douglas Cannell flying FE-2D A6512, uh, the men were under orders to attack any German machine that they came across. Now the larger and more cumbersome FE-2Ds were easy, easily outmaneuvered by the smaller German single-seat fighter, fighters, and as such, the absurdity of this order was later reflected upon by uh, Canal's observer, Lieutenant Albert Woodbridge, when he said that we were, their flight were like butterflies sent out to insult eagles. <laughs> Now across the lines, Richthofen Jost 11 re received an alert of incoming aircraft, and Richthofen led the pilots of Jost 11 up to intercept. Uh, Richthofen and his men found the FE-2Ds of, of 20 Squadron, but instead of attacking straight away, Richthofen led his flight out to the west so as to cut off the British line of retreat. Well, he allowed the FE-2Ds to go deeper into German territory. The, Germans finished, or the British finished their bomb run and turned back toward the lines. As they turned back, an estimated 30 albatrosses attacked them from all different directions. Now, the pilots of the FE-2Ds uh, pulled their machines into the classic defensive circle, and for a while they were able to fend off the attack. 
and hold their formation. Uh, the fight was intense, and Woodbridge would later claim that he had, quote, never seen so many Huns in the air at the same time. Now, meanwhile, uh, Richthofen led his flight back to the east, back towards the melee. And by this time, the British formation had become ragged and begun to pull itself apart. And Richthofen uh, positioned his men to attack uh, what appeared to be the last plane in the formation, which was A-6512, flown by Captain Connell. Now, Connell spotted Richthofen, and he turned his machine around to face Richthofen, thereby <coughs> taking away Richthofen's tactical advantage. But Richthofen, of course, held, kept his calm, pressed his attack, and at an estimated 300 yards, Woodbridge opened fire on Richthofen. Now, according to his account of the battle, Woodbridge said he could see the bullets, see his bullets striking the guns of Richthofen's guns, <coughs> or Richthofen's aircraft. Now, somewhere in the three to four second span of that attack, Richthofen, of course, was struck in the back of the head, possibly indicating a hit from friendly fire. We don't know yet. Uh, but a single bullet creased his skull. It blinded him temporarily, almost knocked him unconscious. His machine fell several thousand meters before he was able to regain his senses enough, of course, to set it down hard in a field full of thistles. Uh, Rick Tobin, of course, survived. You better answer that. <laughs> Rick Tobin survived, um, but badly wounded. He wouldn't fly again until August 16th. Now, the aircraft we're dealing with that day, uh, the exact serial number of this albatross was Rick, Rick, Rick Tobin was flying is unknown, but it bore the classic uh, albatross varnish plywood fuselage. Uh, the red nose, struts, wings, wheel covers, and empennage. And according to Les Rogers' volume, British Aviation Squadron Markings in World War I, the FE-2Ds of 20 Squadron bore no specific mar markings. However, Connell and Woodbridge's machine, A-6512, uh, was apparently a presentation aircraft named Mauritius No. 11, and as a presentation aircraft, this name may have been painted in small letters on the side of the nacelle. Now, before I go any further, I want to give special thanks to our friend James Miller for his outstanding in-depth research on this subject. Uh, my interpretation of this event is based largely on his research. Uh, if you want to find out more about the subject, I highly recommend Jim's book, Manfred von Richthofen, The Aircraft Myths and Accomplishments of the Red Baron. Or if you want to find out more about this event specifically, I'd highly recommend the outstanding article he did for the autumn 2008 issue of Over the Front. Now, it goes without saying that one of the first steps in creating a historical narrative is choosing a moment to depict. Uh, the first thing I have to ask myself is, what is the climax of the story? Where does the drama reach its peak? And then I have to come up with a composition that best expresses that moment. Now, on some, on some paintings, I have an unlimited possibility as to what elements, lines, colors, and compositional elements I can use to tell that story. But in a situation such as this, where the facts are pretty well documented, sometimes the facts surrounding the story can limit the amount of creativity I can put on it. Now, sometimes it, come, it takes a considerable, considerable amount of brain power and a lot of pages in my sketchbook to come up with a composition. But other times, if I'm lucky, I'll have this little aha moment of inspiration where the idea will kind of manifest itself in my head and it makes my job really easy. Uh, in terms of Rick Tobin's July 6 injury, I actually began playing around with this idea at the San Antonio seminar. And I remember riding out to Old Kingsbury Aerodrome, sitting next to Jim Wilberg, and we started discussing this idea. And that's when I first started jotting down sketches for this. And then over the course of a couple of years, I would kind of come back to it and play with it a little more, but I never could really find anything uh, that I felt accurately told the story. Finally, a couple of years ago, actually last year, I was working on a depiction of Ralph O'Neill's first victory, and as I stood in front of my easel with this painting in front of me, suddenly I had that aha moment. I was looking at this composition, and suddenly I could clearly see a similar composition where we're along for the ride with Rick Tobin, 
And as we're going down, we see this big lumbering FE2 coming directly towards us, almost out of the sun. Okay, so now I have a concept. I know what I want to do with it. Um, I want to show Al Ricto and in his albatross going head to head with Canelo Woodbridge in the FE. Now beyond that, there were a few other objectives I wanted to achieve. First of all, I wanted Ricto to be the primary subject here, with the FE2 serving as a secondary subject. Secondly, I wanted to depict the moment right after Rick Tobin's wounding as he's about to pass under the FE2 as described by Connell and Woodbridge. And third, for purely aesthetic reasons, I just wanted to show a good view of the Albatross because it's <laughs> such a sexy airplane. <laughs> okay, so once I have a concept in mind, I go about setting a making a, set a series of thumbnail sketches to work out the composition. Now, I've seen artists who create gorgeous <coughs> thumbnail sketches. Uh, Mike O'Neill creates gorgeous thumbnail sketches, and I hate him for it. Uh, <laughs> mine are really nothing special, uh, but believe it or not, even though I'm a representational artist, and even though I'm drawing airplanes, my aim right now is basically to work with an abstract <coughs> uh, In order for a composition to work, the underlying abstract pattern has to be solid. Now you may not realize it, but when you see a painting from across a room, before your eyes and your brain can begin to interpret the details, what you're taking in is an abstract pattern on a subconscious level. This holds true even with representational art. Our brains process this information before our eyes can begin to interpret the details. If the abstract design of a painting is weak, then the painting itself won't hold together. Now, one issue that a lot of artists struggle with is the ability to tell a story. Uh, what I mean by that is that a painting should, for the most part, be self-explanatory. Uh, if somebody, even if they're not familiar with the story, they should be able to walk up to a painting and be able to glean the basic idea of what's going on. We all know that a picture is worth a thousand words. Now, I mentioned to you a moment ago the concept of visual accuracy. Some artists have a bad idea of painting what they expect to see rather than what they would actually see in a given situation. Certain details of a painting might be important that they might provide the viewer with the necessary uh, information to interpret a scene. Other details might add to a scene, but if rendered too sharply, they may not be true to what the human eye would actually see and perhaps even be best if left out or just left a little bit obscure. I call this, this is what I like to call suggestive information. Now I'm easily bored with paintings that overload the viewer with information and detail all at once. The eye can only take in one subject or one piece of information at a time. I find that the best paintings are those which draw the viewer in and then keep the viewer engaged by moving the eye around the painting and constantly <laughs> revealing small details. It's the, the longer a viewer can stay involved, the longer lasting the impact can be on that viewer. It's sort of a visual hide and seek, if you will, that keeps the viewer in, involved. Now I also mentioned to you the concept of emotional accuracy. We artists have to constantly grapple with the problem of how to engage the viewer, as I said. Some think the answer is to include as many details as possible, but this is sort of a misguided view. Any person can sit down and trace a photograph and come up with an image that's technically accurate, but it might lack the soul and the emotion of an actual experience. Uh, we as artists have to strive to move beyond the simple te technical accuracy and infuse a painting with life and emotion and experience. Tolstoy used the example of two men talking at the end of the day, and they're talking about telling each other about their day. One man simply recounts a series of facts. The other man recounts facts, but he also puts stress and emphasis in certain parts to make the story more dramatic and make it more interesting. That's kind of what we have to do uh, in creating a visual narrative. Now the title for this piece uh, kind of manifested itself very early on, almost to the point where I was doing these thumbnail sketches. Originally I had this idea of uh, Scylla and Charybdis from the story of uh, Odysseus. Uh, and I had this idea of Richtofen being caught between the hostile fire of Woodbridge and the, and the perhaps friendly fire you know, from behind him. 
My wife said that might be a little too esoteric for some folks. <laughs> so, okay, my wife is always right, so I better go back to the drawing board. And I kept coming back to this, this statement by Woodbridge where he mentioned eagles and butterflies, so I settled on the, story, on the title, The Eagle and the Butterfly. Now, after I get my, my composition worked out in a thumbnail sketch, I decided to test the positioning of the aircraft using scale models. Thank you, wingnut wings. <laughs> now, in order to get an idea of the composition and the uh, uh, perspective or the proportions and the sizes in relation to each other, I use scale models. I like the one thirty-second scale because they're a little bit bigger. Now, I'm not a, a hardcore model builder by any means, uh, especially compared to some of you guys. Really, uh, my models are really only a means to an end rather than the end result in, in and of themselves. And to be honest with you, what I do is I build models and I stick them in a drawer so they don't gather dust. I don't even display them. They're tools for me. Now, aviation artists, we have a unique challenge that a lot of other, other artists don't have to address. And that is the challenge of motion and time. Um, that's due to the fact that our subjects are usually moving pretty quickly in an unrestricted manner. We have to ask ourselves, where will the subject be five seconds from now? And we have to arrange the composition so that the subject can get there freely. So the benefit of using models like this is that I can uh, set up the aircraft in close proximity to one another uh, and see if this is going to work. I can make sure that these planes aren't going to collide with each other and I can, I can visualize the path of the albatross as he passes under the FE. Now in this case, when I set up the models according to my sketches, it immediately became clear to me that this wasn't going to work because right here, the FE just dominates the scene and your eye goes straight to that and Richtofen becomes a secondary subject. Not at all what I wanted. So thus taking the models outside I reshot the scene and repositioned the aircraft under natural lighting. And as you can see, the new position for the albatross here works much better. Uh, I chose a backlit scenario where the sun would be coming in from directly behind and above the FE-2. Uh, my thought would be that this would kind of visually wash out the FE-2 and let it sit back so that you can really focus on, on Richtofen's albatross. Now, drawing the aircraft, once I have the composition put together and I know what's going to work, I, and I know what angle I'm going to be viewing the aircraft from, I go about creating a detailed perspective drawing. Now, when I use the term perspective, there are actually two types of perspective. There's atmospheric perspective and there's linear perspective. Atmospheric perspective is an optical solution for creating the illusion of space. Is characterized by the gradation of value, color, and edge. Now I'll discuss atmospheric perspective in, in a few minutes. What we're dealing right here right now with is linear perspective. Linear perspective is a mathematical and quantifiable solution for creating the illusion of space. In order to establish the proper linear perspective, I don't draw directly from the models because slight inconsistencies in my eye position when I'm drawing from a model can translate into large inconsistencies in full scale. In other words, if I've got a model in front of me and I look down at my sketch pad and then raise my head again, if my eye at 1 32nd scale, if my eye shifts one inch in either direction, then on full scale that translates into 32 inches in some different direction and that can be a lot. So in order to establish uh, proper uh, linear perspective, or yeah, linear perspective, I choose a method of isometric drawing or projective geometry which allows me to select a fixed viewpoint and create an accurate three-dimensional drawing from that fixed point. Now, this might sound a little technical, but this is actually a process that's been around for centuries. Uh, projective geometry is an artistic tool for establishing linear, per linear perspective in a two-dimensional space. Based on Euclidean geometry, projective geometry has been around since the Renaissance, 
Beginning in the 15th century, artists such as Brunelleschi, Masaccio, Alberti, and most notably, no, notably Leonardo da Vinci, all experimented with this scientific approach to perspective. In later centuries, it was enhanced even further with the introduction of two- and three-point perspective. In the late 1880s, the American artist Thomas Aikens penned what's probably the most definitive manuscript on linear perspective, and the techniques which he described in his book are still relevant today in contemporary representational art. <coughs> Projective geometry simulates what's called the sight-size method of drawing, where the subject is drawn at the same size at which it's seen from the artist. The main difference is that with projective geometry, the subject is, te is uh, theoretical, whereas with sight size drawing, the subject is actual. Now, once I have my perspective drawn for all, for all the subjects, both the main plane aircraft in this uh, composition, uh, I scan them and I put them in Photoshop. I do a lot of my preliminary work in Photoshop because it allows me to treat the subjects on an individual basis and manipulate them individually. I can move them around, rotate them, resize them, whatever I want to do. Now, I'm sure many of you in this room are familiar with the concept of the golden ratio. Scientists and mathematicians and artists alike will tell you that when we examine the natural world, there are certain intervals and proportions that when we, when we encounter them on an intuitive basis, they just feel right to us. Probably the most famous of these <coughs> is the golden ratio, which is 1 to 0.618. Uh, in this composition, Notice where the two subjects fall. They fall almost directly on the golden ratios. Now you may ask me, why did I not put them directly on the golden ratios? Well, the reason for that is that in addition to the placement within the composition, we also have to take into consideration the intervals between the subjects. And in this case, when I, placed, when I tried placing them directly on the golden ratios, the two planes just felt too far apart from each other. You lost that visual connection that kind of brings the subjects together. Now the next step, once I'm satisfied with the placement of my subjects in the composition, the next step is creating a pencil study. Um, this helps me, this gives me the opportunity to work out the lighting uh, compositions and considerations without the complication of color. This is the point where I abandon the analytical approach and really kind of let my senses drive. Uh, just like a method actor has to place himself into a part and imagine himself being in a situation, I kind of mentally put myself along for the ride with Rick Tobin here and I try to imagine what I would see and what, what it would be like. I picture a lot of noise, I picture sun, blinding sun coming towards me. I picture almost an impression of this hulking, lumbering FE2 coming at me quickly. Uh, bullets are going everywhere, uh, phosphorus trails are all around and there's just a lot of confusion. Since we're riding along with Rick Tovin, uh, the relative speed to Rick Tovin is fairly slow, so we're able to see Rick Tovin's aircraft with a lot of detail. But everything else, including the FE2 that's coming towards us, gets a little bit fuzzy. Now this stage is much more critical than you might think it is, because when we think of paintings, we think of color, right? Color tends to get all the credit, but value is actually what does all the work in a painting. I recently heard an artist named Brian Mayer say that value is the stage in which color performs. Now by this point, all the, art, all the elements have been placed in the composition and carefully tested uh, to see if they support the subject and convey the appropriate sense of action. All the elements should have a purpose. If it doesn't have a purpose, it doesn't belong. My goal is to capture the melee of the moment but not overburden the viewer with too much information. So I have to strike a delicate balance between these elements and the main subjects. Now put another way, our friend Norman Rockwell says that every single object shown in a picture should have its place there because it contributes to the central theme of the picture. Otherwise it should be, simply does not belong, it should be discarded ruthlessly. <laughs> Now comes what's called a color study. Now the color study, uh, idea of a color study means different things to different artists. To some artists, a color study is basically just a little small thumbnail sketch of color. 
My color stud studies are a little bit larger and a little bit more involved. They're basically small versions of the larger painting, uh, slightly less detailed though. Working quickly on a smaller scale like this, this is, uh, I think this was 17 inches wide. Working quickly on a smaller scale like this helps me to figure out exactly what colors need to go where, uh, how intense or muted they need to be, and basically it helps me to spot any other color issues that might arise. And it helps me to uh, address these color issues in a matter of minutes or hours rather than the hours or days that might be spent correcting a painting later on. Now with this color study, I actually did something different and something new for the first time. I painted most of this color study plein air. Now with the plein air method, what I do is I take the models back outside and I paint with the models directly in front of me. I used to create my color studies in the studio uh, based on digital photos and the value study which I had created prior. Now you're probably wondering why do a study plein air outside if you can sit in your studio and paint from a digital photo, right? Well, a digital photo, uh, well, excuse me, the plein air study allows me to gather the necessary information that might be missing or distorted in a digital photo. I find that the addition of the plein air study uh, to the analytical classical technique helps me to infuse the intellectual nature of the one with the emotional nature of the other. And it helps me to uh, give a spontaneous, spontaneous sense of place, which is difficult to simulate when you're working exclusively in a studio. This is something, like I said, that I attempted for the first time uh, when working on the eagle and the butterfly. And one of the first things that I noticed in doing so is how much color information is lost in a backlit scenario. We artists tend to fill in the color that we expect to be there, uh, and thus we a lot of times tend to over magnify the color. Uh, believe it or not, color in nature is not as varied as you think it is. It's really actually kind of drab, and that's why the human eye tends to go towards bright colors because they stand out against the bright drab of nature. In the direct, in the absence of direct observation, we artists, like I said, tend to magnify those colors and in doing so tend to uh, fail to depict reality convincingly. Painting plein air allows me to observe the nuances of color and value with greater sensitivity. If I had painted this in the scene, I might have made the mistake of adding too much color. Now that being said, I can always go back into the studio and add more color if I want, but this gives me a good basis from which to start, which is fairly accurate. Now I'm going to diverge from this painting for a minute and talk about the subject of figures. As a lot of you know, I like to put figures in my work when I can. I like doing ground scenes. The thing with doing ground scenes, though, from a creative point of view, is that when you place figures in a painting, especially multiple figures, uh, it tends to make the composition exponentially more difficult. Now on one hand, Introducing the human element into a painting gives the viewer a psychological bridge by which they can better relate to an image. Uh, simply put, people like to look at people. When figures are involved, the eye naturally gravitates towards the human figure. We always want to know what they're doing, what they're talking about. The, the human figure is always interesting. This is especially true when there's an interaction between two figures. We want to know what they're talking about. This creates a natural point of interest. Now, when you introduce a figure into a painting, you open up a whole new set of considerations. Uh, that is the language of gesture and expression. And the double purpose of figures is they can both be used both to tell a story and as an organic mass in a painting. Uh, figures give a composition an organic sense of life, but the most important aspect to add, adding a figure to a painting is just getting it right. Now, I know you guys are going to find this hard to believe, but there are some people in the world that cannot look at an airplane or a drawing of an airplane and tell if it's right or not. <laughs> but the thing is, the human brain is intuitively wired to the human figure. We all know what the human figure looks like, and thus, if we see a drawing or a painting of a human figure and it's wrong, we know it on a subconscious level, whether or not it's right. Now, going back to the painting, 
Now that I've got everything worked out in the preliminary stages, it's time to start the big painting. Now what I'm here doing here with the big painting is I'm taking what I've created in the color study and in the value study, and I'm basically expounding on it with a wider variety of colors and a broader range of values. I start with the stained canvas onto which I transfer my full scale line drawing. After that what comes what's called the grise layer. Now you might notice that when we, in art, we use the French as the language uh, for our terms. In music you use Italian, artists use French. And I don't speak French, so that kind of, I have to pick up these terms when I can. Now this layer uh, is a monochromatic layer, uh, simply uh, painted with raw umber and white. Uh, this will provide the tonal foundation for the subsequent layers of color. Now I don't bother too much with details at this point and I use mainly large brushes. And you might notice that I'm already starting to build in whites really thickly. And the reason for that is, is that white is the most fugitive pigment. It'll fade faster than any other pigment. Now understand when I say that white will fade faster, I mean that it'll fade in 150 years rather than 500 years. So paintings, oil paintings have a lot of longevity to them. Once that's dry, I start blocking in what's called the abosh, or the first preliminary underpainting. Uh, this is basically my first layer of color, and using my color study as a guide, what I'm doing, what I'm doing here is I'm starting to lay on thin applications of color, which I'll build up later. It's at this stage that I really start to make artistic decisions about the painting uh, regarding the look and the feel. I try to stand back from my painting as I, as I paint and work at arm's length. And doing so allows me to see the entire canvas better uh, so that I can monitor the progress of the overall image and not get caught up in singular details at the moment. There'll be time for those later. At this point, my main concern is just capturing the general feel of the painting and imbuing it with a sense of light and atmosphere. All right, now I mentioned to you a moment ago the concept of atmospheric perspective. Atmospheric perspective is characterized by the gradation of color, value, and edge. Simply put, as objects recede away from the viewer, their characteristics move towards ambiguity. Lights become darker, darks become lighter, warm colors and cool colors both move towards neutral, and details become less distinct. Less distinct. Got that, Ted? <laughs> this occurs in direct relationship with the amount of atmosphere that's between the viewer and the subject. Now, as I'm painting this, I have to juggle all these computations in my mind to figure out exactly what this is going to look like. Now, an aircraft in an air, pay attention, Ted, because we were talking about this yesterday. <laughs> an aircraft will pick up a lot of ambient light and reflected color from all around and including those little nuances really gives a sense of the aircraft existing in a space rather than on a two-dimensional canvas. Uh, you also have to take into consideration the materials and the surfaces that you're painting. Different surfaces have different textures and different reflective properties. The varnished plywood fuselage of the Albatross D5 tended to pick up a lot of reflected light. And Ted, what that is right there is that sky reflected off the fuselage in the shadow area. That would be a little bit blue right there. I, I keep picking on Ted because we had a long discussion about this yesterday. But including these little nuances makes some, for some fun effects in a painting. It really gives it a sense of life. So I've kept Al uh, Rick Tobin's Albatross fairly well defined here since he's the subject. Now at the same time I'm incorporating these various artistic devices to emphasize some areas while de-emphasizing others. In order to give a sense of volume or turn the form as we would say, I have to keep two principles in mind. First of all is that the eye is drawn to areas of contrast. Second of all, cool colors recede, warm colors advance. You'll notice on the bottom of the fuselage here, I've lightened and cooled that color on the bottom of the fuselage away from the warmth of this varnished plywood, and visually that gives you the sense that that fuselage is rolling under and away from you. This same principle, which is called found edge, this is called lost edge right here. Found edge in reverse is why this tail seems to be the closest point to you.
Now, in contrast to the albatross, I'm keeping the lines of the FE2 somewhat fuzzy. Again, that's lost edge. Even the figure of Woodbridge firing from the pulpit of his FE2 uh, is really only defined by a few simple brush strokes. Not only does this prevent the FE2 from drawing your eye too quickly, uh, but it also gives the impression that this FE2 is approaching us from out of the sun. Now comes round two of the color application. This is where the painting really begins to take on its final form. Uh, this is the point where I start uh, tweaking the colors, uh, adding in details or de-emphasizing details in some cases. Uh, you'll notice that I don't always use a paintbrush uh, to spread the paint around. Sometimes the best paintbrush is actually a finger or a palette knife. Now throughout the process it's critical that I continue to judge the work objectively. Sometimes we, spend, we painters tend to spend too much time with our noses buried in the canvas and don't step back enough and observe the work objectively. Now, as I said earlier, I stand at my easel when I paint uh, because it's important for me to be able to step back frequently and take the work in as a whole. When I step back from the easel and view the painting from farther away, uh, the larger elements tend to dominate and the lesser elements disappear and thus it gives me a chance to be able to look at the painting just simply based on the larger elements. Uh, it's also beneficial for me be, to be able to look at the painting uh, in different ways. Other times, or sometimes I'll take the painting and I'll turn it upside down or I'll take it into another room and look at it in a different light. Anything to help me look at it differently. But by far, my favorite tool for alternate viewing is simply a mirror. And when I laid out my studio, uh, what I did was I've got my drawing table directly behind me and I put a six foot wide mirror directly over that table. So when I'm painting, I've got this mirror eight feet behind me and at any time, all I have to do is that, to check my work. And as Alberti pointed out, uh, when you see a painting in a mirror, or see an image in a mirror, all the problems tend to stand out because suddenly we're looking at it fresh, we're looking at it with new eyes, and we're looking at it differently. Now, another good method for checking the work is to take a black and white photo. Uh, this helps me to make sure that my final values are correct and are balanced correctly. Now you'll notice here the composition, the final composition consists of a series of cascading diagonals which infuse the image with a sense of movement. This also, this helps to guide the viewer's eye around the image, but it also gives you a sense that all of these airplanes are moving on three different axes. Now I spoke at the beginning about contrasts and how we artists tend to use contrast to emphasize certain areas and draw uh, the viewer's eye around. Notice the placement of my brightest highlights and my darkest shadows. The highlights are circled in red and the shadows are in green. I've placed my highlights at a triangular point, at triangular points on the wings, and the darkest shadows are placed at the wing root, the cockpit, and the fuselage cross. And what this does is this effectively frames Richtofen in my brightest highlights and my darkest values, so immediately your eye goes right there first. Can I ask a question about that? Yeah. Do you use Photoshop to sort of actually get numeric values on that, or is that strictly just you looking at it saying that's light, that's dark? That's strictly me looking at it. And finally, the final painting. Uh, the final painting measures 45, and, or 45 inches by 22 and a half, same size as this print, this reproduction right here. From beginning thumbnail sketches to the last brush strokes, it took me about uh, cumulatively three months to paint. Now, when I say three months, I work on other paintings at the same time, so those three months worth of work are generally spread out over about six months. Um, and last weekend, as JR said earlier, I'm proud to announce that this painting took the best of show in the 2013 Horizons of Fright, Flight Semi-Flight Exhibition in Dallas, Texas.
tradition in these shows. And here are a few detailed shots. Here's Woodbridge firing from his pulpit. White's got a little washed out in this uh, projection. Hey, Russ. He was probably I'm actually. Sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt. Can, can you go back two slides for me? I have need to ask Ted a question. That hey, one? Ted. <laughs> 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 you see that, see that yellow smear down by the, yeah, it's a foot. What, what is that? So it's the reflection coming off the river below. <laughs> it's, it's a reflection of a light of a, an area, a right. cloud or something. Close enough. <laughs> we'll take that. That's it's the my scroll. Grazie. <laughs> it, it's the reflection of the light off the wing oh. since, the, uh -huh. since the fuselage is sort of a warm straw color, as it was described. It's going to turn a little bit yellow there. I found if I made it too strong, it distracted the eye, so I kept it low key. But I did want to indicate that light bouncing off the wing there. Russell, am I seeing that the head wound has already been inflicted? The head wound has already been deflicted, uh, inflicted, and he's slumped over in the cockpit. Mm -hmm. You can see the blood. Yeah. 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 I thought about putting a little splatter, but... <laughs> <laughs> yes? How do you do the wires? Ah, there's the million dollar question. Uh, it's really actually very simple. A straight edge, a mechanical drawing pencil, and when my next to the last layer of paint is dry, I just basically draw them in, and then as I'm coming over with this finish layer, I get a very, very small brush and very thin paint and just lightly paint over those lines. <coughs> you should be doing facial expressions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, Lloyd. The self-impressionism of yourself. It's you not in there. You didn't I, I often order. do that, you know, a lot of artists over time and they, in, throughout the centuries when they put figures in their work uh, will put their own likeness in these. Michelangelo was notorious for it. If you go into the Sistine Chapel, there are at least three different self-portraits in the Sistine Chapel. Uh, but yes, if I can show a face in a, in a painting, oftentimes I'll put myself in there just for fun. Yes. Really outstanding presentation. Thank you. Thank you. The question I have is that this is a bit of a nit. You, you had talked about uh, where is the subject going to be in five seconds. Mm -hmm. How do you think about the control surfaces that, that put the subjects where they're at presently and where they will be? In five you seconds? have to plan for that. You do have to take that into consideration. I have to imagine where the subject's going to go, what he's doing at that moment, how he might be, how even how the pilot might be reacting. If he's banking one way, and I think he suddenly might react and bank the other way, I might need to, to uh, turn the control surfaces to show that. So that's really kind of an artistic interpretation of what might be going on, unless we know for a fact that he banked right and dove that way. Are you, are you a pilot as well, or have you checked with pilots to, to get their impressions? Of I've, I've got a few hours, and yes, there are a couple of pilots in this room who I'll run it past and say, hey, does this look right? <laughs> Can you go forward to, to the party you were before we backed up. Yeah. This way? Yeah. Yes, Mike. Woo. Yes. This, will, this will talk to this point to some you brought this up. That the thing that Russ was trying to emphasize before, which which the the lay person doesn't always take into account is we know those are FE twos in the back because of the, the layout of the airplane, but those things are painted with just a couple of brush strokes. Yeah. Yeah. He spends all day working on the details, as I pointed out before. Your eye is going to go right to those things, and he's trying to leave those guys way mm -hmm. in the background so that all the, the interest is up front. And he's done that in layers here, which is why this painting works so beautifully. That first airplane has got the most detail on it, and as it steps back, there's less and less and less and less, mm -hmm. just as you would see. And that's why, Russ, I, I think this is, I, I've seen a lot of your work, and I, the, the visual aerial effect, the airiness of this painting is by far, in my opinion, the best thing that you've done in that arena. Thank you. Ted. Your plenary study, you're outside and the sun's moving the whole time. How quick do you work? Well, you have to paint fast. Okay. And that is something you have to learn to do because by nature, I'm not a fast painter. I'll take my time and I get distracted in the studio. Sometimes in the studio I'm like a child who's been given 10 pixie sticks and set loose in a toy store with a puppy. You know? <laughs> but you really, I mean, it, you have to plan on working quickly and a lot of times with these plein air studies you can't linger on details. You just have to get the general look down and then come back into the studio and translate from that. One more question, I'm sorry. The, the varnish versus the gesso? Gesso is the base on which you paint. It's usually, what I use is acrylic. 
basically just put it on the canvas and paint on top of that. Varnish is the last thing you do. It's clear, and you have to wait several months before you put that on. That's a preservative step. I need to get, get you guys a 10-minute break. I'm sorry. Uh, catch him afterwards and uh, yeah. we'll report back. Come on back at 10 for our general session. You, you guys, I'm going to be around this afternoon. Yeah. We're you know, going out to Fantasy of Flight, so feel free to ask me questions. Yeah.